You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed. Finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. Viktor Frankl's mother, father, brother, and wife died in concentration camps in the Holocaust. Only his sister survived. She'd escaped to Australia shortly before the family's deportation in 1942. They were first sent to the Theresienstadt ghetto, north of Prague, where his father would die. Frankl and his wife Tilly, followed by his mother, were all sent to Auschwitz. His mother immediately perished in the gas chambers. Tilly was moved to Bergen-Belsen, where she died at age 24. Frankel himself was transported in cattle cars via Vienna to subsidiary camps of Dachau. He survived typhoid fever and was finally liberated on April 27, 1945. Austrian neurologist and psychologist Viktor E. Frankel was born in 1905. In his pre-war career, he organized a counseling program for fellow students at the University of Vienna. Suicide would become a particular focus for Frankel in his career. He was known to often ask his patients, why do you not commit suicide? Their answers would reveal what still held meaning in their lives. The will to meaning became the basis of Frankel's philosophy, logotherapy. The name came from the Greek word for meaning, logos. Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning went on sale in Germany in 1946. Originally, Frankl wanted it to be published anonymously, with just his prison number on the cover. The book was published in English in 1959 and became a bestseller in the United States. By the time of Frankl's death in 1997, the book had been translated into 24 languages and had sold over 10 million copies. It's often considered one of the most important nonfiction books ever written. In this book, Insight, we'll explore the following themes from Frankel's seminal work. First, Frankel's experiences in the Nazi concentration camps. Second, the ability to choose our thoughts and actions. Third, the quest for meaning amid extreme suffering and injustice. And fourth, logotherapy and finding your purpose in life. We'll conclude by taking a look at the wider impact that Frankel and his work have had. The only people who tended to be spared instant death in the gas chambers were able-bodied men. They spent long days doing manual labor in sub-zero temperatures. They often had only a piece of bread to eat the whole day, sometimes with a scrap of butter or a tiny chunk of poor-quality sausage. They were given coupons with which they could buy soup or cigarettes. Frankel would often trade a cigarette for soup, and it would be the only thing that stopped him from dropping to the floor due to exhaustion. He recalls one day greedily sipping soup before looking out of the window and seeing the white eyes of a corpse staring back. He realized that the face was familiar. He had had a conversation with that man only hours before. Here's Frankel in an interview during the 1980s. There is nobody who can guarantee me and convince me that I shall not survive but end in the gas chamber. As long as I have no guarantee that I will have to die within the next days, I continue behaving and acting as if I would spare this fate. The prisoners were stripped of their belongings and shaven from head to toe when they arrived at the camp. Not only were they literally naked, but they were robbed of their names and identities. Frankel remembers how upon arrival to Auschwitz, prisoners would ask if they could keep a treasured possession, perhaps a wedding ring or a watch. Frankel himself had wanted to keep an important scientific manuscript that he wrote, his life's work, but this was taken. It was at these points that he and his fellow prisoners realized that nothing would ever be the same. Life now consisted solely of an effort to survive. According to Frankel, 
only one prisoner in 28 would live through the war. To beat these odds, you had to find a way not only to physically survive, but to find a reason to keep living. To stay hopeful, you had to have a purpose so meaningful that it transcended daily beatings, the constant threat of torture and death, as well as disease and starvation. This greater purpose allowed all the devastation to be seen as part of a much bigger, more meaningful picture. Frankel observed that prisoners tended to move through stages. First was shock, then emotional detachment, then apathy. He saw the eyes of several men who seemed like the walking dead. They had given up, and it surely wouldn't be long before they perished. Prisoners often found a grim sense of humor in their own situation. This was one way of coping with their brutal reality. For example, one prisoner pointed toward a capo. A capo was a prisoner who acted as a guard of the prisoners. The prisoner said, Imagine, I knew him when he was only the president of a bank. The final stage prisoners went through was depersonalization. Frankel felt he was stripped to a lower, basic form of mental life. Every day was a fight to wake up early so as not to be beaten for slacking. Then a prisoner endures the punishing work routine while dealing with severe malnutrition. Even sleeping was unbearable, with hard wood beds and up to nine men sharing a single blanket. They only had their own arms for pillows. Frankel recalls how one night the man beside him was tossing and turning, having a terrible nightmare. He instinctively thought to wake him, but thought again. The reality of being awake in that place was worse than any nightmare. We'll take a brief break before we continue, but before we go, let's go over what we've covered. Viktor Frankl was a neurologist and psychologist at the University of Vienna. When Nazi Germany took command of Austria, Frankl's family was put into concentration camps. Only Viktor survived the camps. While at Auschwitz, Frankel observed his own suffering as well as the suffering of other prisoners. The four stages a prisoner went through were shock, emotional detachment, apathy, and then depersonalization. All of these together eventually stripped prisoners of their identity and humanity. We'll continue our exploration into man's search for meaning next time. We'll look at how choice factors into a seemingly hopeless situation, then, we'll look at the quest for meaning. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our look into Victor E. Frankel's legendary memoir. It's called Man's Search for Meaning. Previously, we've gone over some of Frankel's history. Frankel observed some of his fellow prisoners at Auschwitz and Dachau, recognizing the stages each prisoner goes through in the death camp. The final stage was depersonalization. Now we'll look at how there's always space to choose our thoughts and actions, then, we'll look at the quest for meaning amid extreme suffering and injustice. How did Frankel find a way of keeping hope alive? We already mentioned how prisoners often used a grim sense of humor to lighten situations. Another way was to talk about food. Some prisoners would agree to meet one day in the future and imagine sumptuous feasts. Frankel himself found a psychological support in imagining his wife. Even though he had no idea if she was alive, he would have imaginary conversations with her. He remembers one day visualizing her so vividly that when a bird hopped onto a mound nearby, the bird itself seemed to be her living embodiment. To Frankel, this kind of imagining was proof that humans, no matter how dire their external situation, always have the ability to choose how they react to every passing moment. 
No matter how torturous and mundane, there would always be moments in a day where he could decide to help a fellow prisoner or to offer conversation to a capo. When everything else had been taken from him, he could still choose his thoughts and actions. Here's Frankel again from an interview. The decisive factor is decision, the freedom to, of choice. It should be, I would like to become this way or another in spite of conditions that should only seem to fully determine my behavior. I wish to act freely as a responsible being. Frankel used his professional skills as a psychiatrist to treat prisoners and offer advice. But he had yet to figure out his own deep meaning for all the suffering he was enduring. Then, one day, it came to him. He suddenly visualized a warm, comfortable lecture theater. It was packed with an audience, and in front of the audience, Frankel stood, giving a lecture on the psychological effects on prisoners in the Nazi concentration camps. Frankel now understood why he was here. His own experience in the camps and his observation of other prisoners enduring unimaginable suffering. This could be a valuable insight into the human psyche. The ideas he had theorized about before the war, about psychological meaning, were now being put to the ultimate test. How is it possible to face suffering when it is so natural to try to avoid it? The average person judges the quality of their life on what they expect from it and what is delivered. The quality of life is judged by happiness and achievement. But Frankel sees this as irresponsible, because it means that we can only be happy if we always get everything we want. Instead, we must ask what life expects of us, day by day, no matter what our external circumstances. We accept unconditional responsibility for our lives and our experience, whether or not it's the life we planned. Everyone wants freedom, but this must be balanced by responsibility. Frankel remarks that the Statue of Liberty should be complemented by another statue on the other side of America, a statue of responsibility. Frankel was liberated from Dachau by advancing American soldiers in 1945. He saw the outside of the camp for the first time and was able to freely roam country roads and fields. But Frankel remembers that it seemed unreal. There was a numbness, a disbelief. He forgot what it was like not to be under the constant threat of death. Despite their new freedom, many survivors could barely smile. Eventually, they began to recover, eating ravenously and taking joy in the world around them. Frankel remembers a spark of joy when seeing a rooster walking in a farmyard. From a psychological perspective, Frankel notes that being given such sudden freedom was dangerous. Once they returned to physical health, the men then had to come to terms with loss of loved ones, deep injustice, and the fact that for most of them, there was no home to return to. Frankel remembers walking one day with a fellow survivor and coming to a field of crops. While Frankel carefully walked around the crops, the survivor lashed out and destroyed some of the plants. He was infuriated when Frankel didn't partake, saying that these people had taken so much from them and made them suffer. Harming a few crops was the least they could do. From the time of their liberation, different people would react to injustice in their own ways. But the point Frankel makes is that we go to great lengths to not accept our own suffering. Yet, in such extreme circumstances, success can simply mean the courage to accept that suffering as your single and unique task. No one can stand in your place. Here's Frankel again from the interview from the 1980s. Despair can be explained in terms of a mathematical equation. D equals S minus M. Despair is suffering without meaning. As long as an individual cannot find, cannot see any meaning in his or her despair, he or she will certainly be prone to despair and, under certain conditions, to suicide. Frankel's unique opportunity, then, was how he would choose to bear his burden. As a survivor after the war, 
He felt it was his responsibility not to hold a grudge against ex-Nazi soldiers. He believed there's no evil people, only decent and indecent men in certain situations. Men could act courageously in one situation and selfishly in others. He remembers a Nazi doctor before the war, Dr. J, who manned a euthanasia unit in Vienna. Dr. J was responsible for the deaths of many disabled people. However, after the war, Frankel learned that the doctor was imprisoned by the Soviets and proved to be a very loyal friend and helpful resource to fellow prisoners. Some of Mann's search for meaning is reminiscent of Hannah Arendt's book Eichmann in Jerusalem. Having observed the 1960s trial of Nazi Adolf Eichmann, Arendt concluded that there was nothing inherently evil about the man. He had simply found himself in an environment in which, to further his career, he had to help organize the transportation of thousands of people to their deaths. In an echo of what Frankel says about responsibility, Eichmann had decided that he would only focus on doing his job in an efficient manner. He would take no responsibility for the suffering that it might lead to. Yet Frankel tried to show that even amid the most depraved set of circumstances, there was still space for individual conscience and individual action. Therefore, Eichmann may not have been evil, but he was culpable. Humans are capable of great evil, for sure, but we are also creators of beauty and meaning. As Frankel puts it, our generation is realistic, for we have come to know man as he really is. After all, man is that being who invented the gas chambers of Auschwitz. However, he is also that being who entered those gas chambers upright, with the Lord's Prayer or the Shema Yisrael on his lips. Hunger, torture, and filth served to desensitize the prisoners. And yet, despite being herded and treated as animals, many men in the camps somehow avoided a mob mentality. Frankel's point here is that we can never predict the behavior of an individual and can make few generalizations about humanity as a species. We'll break one last time in our discussion on man's search for meaning. But first, let's recap. Even in the most hopeless of times, a person can still choose their thoughts and actions. As Frankel once described, between the stimulus and the response is choice. We also learned that your individuality is key to survival. Sometimes evil is weakness or it shifts. Only when you suffer without meaning do you despair. We'll conclude next time by explaining how logotherapy helps reveal your purpose in life. Then, we'll look at the book's legacy and criticisms. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're concluding our look into Man's Search for Meaning. It's written by Austrian neurologist, psychiatrist, and Holocaust survivor, Viktor E. Frankl. Last time, we went over the power of choice and meaning in hopeless situations. Now, we'll go into greater detail on logotherapy and finding your purpose in life. Then, we'll end by reflecting on the book's history and its detractors. Friedrich Nietzsche once wrote, He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. This famous line becomes a kind of mantra for Frankel and the foundation of a new psychology of meaning and purpose, logotherapy. Whereas Freud's psychoanalysis required a person to look inward to reveal the basis of their neuroses, logotherapy tries to take the person out of themselves to see their life in a broader perspective. Where psychoanalysis focuses on the will to pleasure and Alfred Adler's psychology on the will to power, logotherapy sees the prime motivating force in human beings to be a will to meaning. Logotherapy sees mental health in the tension between what one is and what one could become. But what if we are still yet to identify what we could become? Frankel notes that the modern person has almost too much freedom to deal with. 
We no longer live through instinct, yet tradition is no guide either. The frustrated will to meaning is compensated for in the urge for money, sex, entertainment, and even violence. Yet in logotherapy, existential distress is not neuroses or mental disease, but a sign that we are becoming more human in the desire for meaning. In contrast to Freud or Adler, Frankel chose not to see life simply as the satisfaction of drives or instincts, or even in becoming well-adjusted to society. Instead, he and humanistic psychologists like Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers believed that the outstanding feature of human beings is their free will. Here is Frankel one last time in an interview from the 1980s. Those inmates or prisoners were most likely to survive the camp period. Those, I say, who were orientated toward a future, oriented to a meaning that they had to fulfill in the future, a task that they had to complete in the future, and or to be reunited with their beloved people in the future again. But how do we discover our own purpose? Imagine you are struggling to find a job. You complete applications, nervously attend interviews, only to get numerous letters of rejection. After some time, you start to see your bad luck as being a part of you, and you start to get depressed. Now let's imagine you're sitting with Frankel explaining your problem. Frankel would firstly identify a major error here, that you're conflating not getting a job with failure. You're depressed because getting a job became your only purpose. But Frankel insists there are three ways to find meaning or purpose. 1. Create a project or work or do a deed. 2. Find love and passion by meeting someone or experiencing something. And 3. Take a particular attitude towards unavoidable suffering. Pursuing happiness on its own doesn't make sense to Frankel. Happiness is a byproduct of the pursuit of meaning, which is easily found in the undertaking of a great task, project, or career. Love is also a legitimate path to great meaning. Frankel reflects on how he imagined his wife in the camp. He writes, I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. Finally, our unique response to suffering can give us purpose. Frankel never forgot that his suffering, no matter how painful or unjust, offered opportunities to learn about himself bit by bit. If he had railed against his circumstances, he would have felt even worse and learned nothing. Frankel makes observations on 20th century society that still resonate today. In a world of technology, innovation, and comparative wealth, many people are desperately unhappy. Frankel gives this a specific term, the existential vacuum. We now have almost too much freedom and fail to see that material possessions and physical pleasure provide only temporary happiness. To this end, Frankel's brand of psychotherapy treats existential problems and neuroses as positive characteristics, as part of a will to meaning. It's been used to treat a range of patients suffering from anxiety, OCD, depression, schizophrenia, and also mental health issues of the terminally ill. At the source of many mental health conditions are deep, debilitating fears, including the fear of suffering. By accepting in the first place that life involves suffering, we are then freed up to pursue a life of meaning. Yet paradoxically, it's only this kind of life that is likely to lead to more fulfillment and happiness. Okay, let's have an overview of what we've learned in this book Insight. We first examined Frankel's experiences in concentration camps in the Holocaust. While he endured unimaginable suffering, he found a way of using his imagination to transcend his external circumstances and ultimately to visualize his future. We delved into the psychology behind Frankel's work and his idea that responsibility is an essential component of leading a meaningful life. Ultimately, the courage to accept suffering is a decision only we can make, but it's the basis of psychological maturity. We also explored how Frankel's logotherapy can help treat the existential problems we all face. 
Frankel's career in psychiatry resumed soon after the war. He was appointed head of the Vienna Polyclinic of Neurology. He became a professor of neurology and psychiatry at the University of Vienna in 1955. In the 1960s, he was a visiting professor at several U.S. universities. Just as he'd imagined in the camp, he gave hundreds of talks. He'd received 28 honorary doctoral degrees for his work. Logotherapy never became a major stream of psychotherapy, but Frankel's work has inspired many, particularly in the field of personal development. Stephen Covey, for instance, cites him as a major influence in writing The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Frankel's message also chimes with the Stoic teachings of Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. Frankel has faced criticism that he gives a distorted perspective of prisoners' lives in Auschwitz. Critics cite that in actuality, he didn't spend a lot of time in the camp. He was fortunate to be transferred to the less barbarous Dachau, it's also been noted that the will to meaning could be used for evil as much as good. Who is to say that cruelty or fascism is not meaningful for the people who practice it? Despite these criticisms, the fact remains that Frankel's book contributed to public education on the atrocities of the Holocaust and continues to provide much-needed perspective to readers. The survivors of concentration camps were often left broken on all levels. They spent the rest of their lives reliving the trauma, in this sense, surviving the camps was only half the battle. Man's search for meaning sheds light on the meaning Frankel found that helped save his own life and has helped millions find meaning in their lives ever since. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice.